Hello, I'm Michael Grossberg, founder and board member of the Libertarian Futures Society, launched in 1982 to sustain the Prometheus Awards for Best Pro Freedom, SF, and Fantasy. And this is the 2020 Prometheus Awards ceremony at the online North American Science Fiction Convention. Welcome. Do stick around afterwards, immediately afterwards, for our panel discussion on visions of SF, liberty, human rights, the Prometheus Awards over four decades from F. Paul Wilson and Robert Heinlein to today. The Prometheus Awards take their name from the ancient Greek myth about a titan who risked angering the gods by bringing fire to mankind. Quote, the myth undergirding the civilization of the West, French philosopher Louis Rougier wrote in his 1969 book, The Genius of the West, is the myth of Prometheus, the philanthropic hero who dared defy the will of Zeus by stealing fire from heaven and giving it to mortal men whom that jealous tyrant of the heaven and the earth had decided to destroy. The story expresses the spirit of revolt against the prohibition of jealous gods and embodies that love of action which incited Hercules to rid the earth of tyrants." End quote. Libertarian futurists recognize that art and culture can fire up the imagination about the limitless possibilities of liberty and justice for all. That's why the Prometheus Awards for four decades have recognized speculative fiction that dramatizes the perennial conflict between liberty and power champions cooperation over coercion as the ethical path to peace, prosperity, and progress, and envisions a better world for all in which libertarian principles of non-aggression, self-ownership, volunteerism, and individual rights are respected. Over four decades, the LFS and the Prometheus have been recognized themselves with increasing attention and respect. For example, in June, a Quillette magazine article on the libertarian history of science fiction referenced our awards and tradition dating back to the late 1970s of giving winners a gold coin, quote, representing free trade and free minds. The article also explains why libertarian themed science fiction remains a key part of modern science fiction. Here's a quote. The soil of speculative fiction has the right nutrients for the flourishing of libertarian values, unlike most ideologies that advocate forms of protectionism, Luddite restrictionism, and central planning, the libertarian outlook values choice, freedom, and market solutions. Another element in both SF and libertarianism certainly is a general openness to radical new ideas and an instinctive rejection of stale convention and custom, end quote. Now it's my great honor to introduce F. Paul Wilson, Grand Master of Horror and Prometheus Award Lifetime Award Achievement winner. Paul has written over 60 books spanning science fiction, horror, adventure, medical thrillers, and young adult, with over 8 million books in US print. Paul won the first Prometheus, presented by L. Neil Smith in 1979, to his SF mystery, Wheels Within Wheels. Wilson has since won other Prometheuses for Healer, Sims, and An Enemy of the State. Paul will present the 2020 Prometheus Award for Best Novel. So, that first Prometheus Award. I remember receiving a letter telling me my second novel, Wheels Within Wheels, had won the Prometheus Award. Uh, the internet was young back then and email wasn't a real thing, so it, it came by Pony Express. Um, I remember thinking, what is the Prometheus Award? And who or what is the uh, Libertarian Futures, Futurist Society? So nowadays, it's four plus decades later, and everybody knows the Prometheus Award. But back then, it was the new kid on the block. The gold coins that went with the prize were nice, but the best thing for me was learning that there were kindred souls out there. For the most part, we write in isolation. I mean, we get feedback from our editor and reviewers, but before the web, if readers wanted to contact you, they had to sit down and write a letter, then mail it to the publisher, who then had to forward it to your agent, who then forwarded it to you. Um, the few letters that reached you uh, were often from long-term prisoners with lots of free time and, and, and looking for free books. Um, but here it was, these like-minded people saying, we saw what you did and we get it. 
and we want to recognize you for it. I wasn't used to that. Um, I remember stepping onto the Georgetown campus in the September of 1964 in the middle of the Johnson Goldwater presidential race and immediately realizing that I was a political orphan. The word libertarian existed back then. And if I remember, it meant just meant someone who believed in free will. Um, but it really wasn't in the political vocabulary. So I didn't know what I was. I just knew I wasn't like them and them being everyone else I met. Uh, the free speech movement was sweeping campuses back then and demanding that students and professors be allowed to say whatever they damn well pleased. Mario Savio was sort of the figurehead of that. A very libertarian position. And now the anti-free speech movement is sweeping campuses, demanding that all students and professors adhere to the latest approved version of Newspeak. So clearly, we need the consciousness raising presence of the Prometheus Award more than ever. So let's get to it. The five finalists for the 2020 Prometheus Award for Best Novel in alphabetical order by author are The Testaments by Margaret Atwood, Random House, Alliance Rising by C.J. Cherry and Jane S. Francher, Daw Books, Ruins Wake by Patrick Edwards, Titan Books, Luna, Moon Rising by Ian MacDonald, Tor Books, and Ode to Defiance by Mark Stiegler, LMBPN Publishing. And the Prometheus Best Novel winner is Alliance Rising by Cherry and Francher. Okay, why isn't my picture going, guys? Hello? Your picture was fine for a second. Turn it back on. Your picture's good. Go. Oh, great. I can't see myself. <laughs> oh, we're okay. oh, we're in trouble now. Um, I'm Jane. This is CJ. She wanted me to go first. Um, and I think that's because it's kind of my fault that this book happened in the first place. Um, and so uh, I said, no problem. And then the, uh, I'm, I'm used to talking at conventions and making it up as I go along. But the, uh, uh, then we got a notice that we were supposed to write it out so that they would have something to post online. And that's a little harder because I don't write speeches. Um, so I started stressing and um, uh, instead of going to the blank screen and doing something with it, I uh, brought up Spider Solitaire and found the only unsolvable uh, problem uh, that M Microsoft ever made. I finished it, so now I have to talk. Um, let me start by just saying thank you very much uh, to the Libertarian Futurist Society uh, just for putting us on the ballot um, alongside so many other great books. That would have been cool enough uh, to actually win has my diehard libertarian brother doing a virtual Snoopy dance. Yes, I, I grew up with a very libertarian brother and I cannot say that it did not affect the way I feel about the universe in general. Um, but we couldn't be happier. Any author hopes in the back of their mind to do win some kind of award when they start doing this um, to win one that acknowledges the successful incorporation of a powerful message like this, that's just about perfect. Um, and uh, um, the other person we need to thank is Betsy Walheim at Daw Books. Um, we couldn't have done it without her support and enthusiasm. She loves the Alliance Union, Alliance Union universe in which it's set as much as we do. Um, and uh, we've wanted to do an open collaboration for years. Daw gave us that chance. And um, thank you, Betsy, very much for believing in us and for your excellent input that helped us clarify the very complex tangled elements of this story. And that sound, if you heard it, is our cat on his scratching post, the joys of, of uh, uh, home video. Yes. Uh, <laughs> so why am I responsible? 
because before we ever met, I was a big fan of Carolyn's. And as much as I love her 400 books, I'm really a fan of the um, uh, Alliance Union universe. And over the years, I built up lots and lots of questions that I pestered her with. Once we started working together, she got pestered even more because I knew more about it and I knew there was a lot that hadn't been said. So when we got the chance to do an open collaboration, um, it really was my first choice. Uh, it's, um, uh, it deals with a, it's, it's the earliest of the Alliance Union books, and it deals with uh, a point in time when everything come, uh, everything shifts from a corporate owned uh, power structure to a free trade power structure. And um, uh, I'm actually going to let Carolyn talk a little more about that. I'm going to kind of truncate this. They can read it online. Uh, <laughs> um, but uh, uh, the, um, uh, the merchanters, it, the alliance involved is the merchanters, and the merchanters are the key element of the free trade and um, uh, uh, freedom of, of living style, if you will, uh, that it's at the core of the book. Um, there's a lot more that I wrote that will be online, and I'm just going to let Carolyn take over because it's really her universe, and she has just invited me in to play in it, and I couldn't be happier. Well, <laughs> um, when I was asked to reprise and catch up with a universe that began, I guess, back in the 80s. Um, it was a little daunting. Um, when I started out to write the books in the first place, I began with a star map, a real star map, uh, the nearest stars to Earth, the stars closest to the sun, obviously. I started my map. I made my calculations with the aid of an Atari computer, you may imagine, and a lot of tractor feed paper. I worked out a route within the realm of possibility, uh, but a lot of real astronomy has happened since then, and I was a little nervous. I mean, had anything been discovered that was just going to put the absolute uh, kibosh on things that I had imagined? Well, I got to reading and researching, and no, it was actually even better. So. Um, I'm, I'm real happy to, to say that the places out there, uh, Alpha and uh, Venture and all of those still remain viable when we decide to take advantage of them. And after a certain time, um, we, we decided that we should start laying down plot. We headed for our favorite pub, staked out our usual booth, the waiters know we're slightly different. And we began plotting and uh, made a trip to Seattle, still plotting all the way back. We laid out our basic scenario um, based on things that have turned up in already published books because of course we're now writing the beginning of everything that I'd laid down since. Oh, I forgot to mention, I really wanted really wanted Captain James Roberts and Finity's End's story. So I was willing to hold my breath to do this particular story to fill in the blanks. Go ahead. Well, um, <laughs> fortunately, she was willing. <laughs> yes. Um, Captain James Robert, who, who figures in a Filk song. Um, and in a lot of the books. And in several of the books, yes, um, was the must have. So, of course, he's there, and so are a number of the, the merchanters uh, of the era. And um, uh, we began figuring out how to manage this collaboration that we were about to do. And we ended up with our own method. Um, uh, I was sort of responsible for, for Captain James Roberts, or JR as he calls himself. Jane was the one who suggested Ross, who we pretty well had to have. 
Um, you need somebody who doesn't know anything. Yeah, um, Ross doesn't really doesn't know anything. Has and, to have everything uh, explained to them. Yeah, <laughs> but at any rate, um, we went from there, and it's sort of like um, we'd um, uh, work and trade back and forth, and back and forth, and back and forth, and the end result is, on any given paragraph of that book, neither one of us can figure out who wrote it. And the actual answer is we both did. And when we got to um, uh, the merchanters, um, we had to develop the history there as well. Um, they are descendants of the pusher ships that used to serve the stations traveling for decades. That again um, is something that is established. Can I interrupt for just yeah, a minute? Yeah, sure, absolutely. <laughs> One of the things about this series is that it is um, establishing the details of things that are alluded to in a whole bunch of other books. And um, the exciting thing about this time is that it is when the merchanters who are the core of free trade um, come into their own. And that was one reason that I was so excited to do it because the economy, the issues of freedom and everything else for the first time really do take center stage in one of the Alliance Union stories. And we didn't set out to, uh, we, we had no notions of Prometheus Award in our heads when we started it. Um, but it wrote. is, but I, <laughs> but I understand now exactly why, um, yeah, we just, the, the book deserved to be uh, addressed um, or considered for it, and we are really thankful. Um, but uh, it is an exciting time in the Alliance Union universe. Does that help? That helps. Okay. okay. Um, anyway, um, the Earth Company started everything. Uh, they sent out the original pusher ships, and they believe they own everything. Uh, and continue to own it centuries later. Meanwhile, anybody who has done um, uh, work for hire mm -hmm. and resented it when they come up with something that makes a whole bunch of money for the uh -huh. uh, parent company can understand the problems that arose with this eventually. And eventually, of course, as the, the trail of stars visited uh, and brought into this system, suddenly includes Tau Ceti which is a G-class star and has a planet. Um, they, uh, not only that, in, in our world, a, a life-bearing planet, um, that tossed the whole arrangement into limbo because they had a new source. Of food. Of food and of life stuffs and everything. And the company store had competition. And that didn't play well back on Earth, who took probably, well, six point something another years to get the information to do about it. And that didn't work real well either. So eventually, uh, division happened. The, um, the, uh, the whole thing, I see a notice that we could lose our internet connection, so perhaps I had better <clears throat> haste. Um, this is what eventually brought the, uh, brought the uh, group of merchanters to Alpha, the first of all stations, and the only station still under EC Earth Company control, um, to deliver a message to the local merchanters, they wanted them to join them. That there this, were options to the- There were options. There were options to the Earth Company. And um, of course the Earth Company didn't take this totally well. Um, but um, uh, eventually um, there's a necessary fallout, uh, which makes up the body of the story. I won't go into that here. But um, when you start telling a story about human civilization, um, your, your conflict between freedom and economics and the people who try to control it all 
Um, there's, it just happens. I mean, it's, it's just part of humanity. And this kind of story will go on being valid so long as there are two-footed individuals of our general description wandering about. It's just what we do. It's forces that are in necessary opposition. And uh, a certain amount of it produces order. A certain amount of too much of it um, produces tyranny. And when tyranny arises, it has to be dealt with. Um, and I'm, I'm very glad that Jane dug me into, <laughs> into actually doing this story. Uh, I have to thank uh, Betsy and Daw. Um, we got to go there together. And um, writing can be a solitary kind of occupation. And Betsy's been in on the AU stuff since oh, down below yeah. station. She was... Uh... But, but you know, when, you're, when you write, you've got nobody to, to cheer at the good bits, nobody to talk through the stuck spots. And then when you've got somebody who can, you can just toss the file to and say, ah, take it. And then it comes back and something magical has happened and there is an answer and it, it all works. That's what a good collaboration is like. And uh, I think of it as a gift, a, a very special gift. And I thank you all very much for the recognition given this particular special book. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks a lot for uh, that backstory, uh, Jane and uh, Carolyn Cherry on the book. We really appreciate it. Um, Carolyn Cherry is my fellow University of Oklahoma alum. It's been a, a few years since she signed my first edition of Gate of Ivrel uh, at the OU Student Union. Hi, I'm Tom Jackson, a Libertarian Futurist Society board member. And I'm here to introduce Sarah Hoyt, who will present the 2020 Prometheus Hall of Fame Award for Best Classic Fiction. The Hall of Fame Award has gone to a wide range of works, including Hans Christian Andersen's The Emperor's New Clothes, Paul Anderson's Traitor to the Stars, Ray Bradbury's Fahrenheit 451, Anthony Burgess's A Clockwork Orange, Robert Heinlein's A Moon is a Harsh Mistress, J.R. Tolkien's The Lord of the Rings, and last year's winner, Kurt Vonnegut's story, Harrison Bergeron. Our presenter is award-winning, prolific novelist, Sarah Hoyt. Sarah writes science fiction, fantasy, mystery, and historical fiction, and has written more than 30 novels. She won the 2018 Dragon Award for Best Alternate History Novel for Uncharted, co-authored with Kevin J. Anderson but we like to think she particularly treasures her 2011 Prometheus Award for Best Novel for Dark Ship Thieves, the first in a series of novels set within our solar system and portraying a libertarian anarchist asteroid society. There are five novels in the series, at least so far. So here to present the Hall of Fame Award, would you please welcome our friend, Sarah Hoyt. Okay, that should be working, right? Um, I do particularly treasure the uh, Prometheus Award because before that I felt like I was writing in this little dark corner and suddenly I realized I wasn't alone. So that was an important moment. Um, I think it's important to write about liberty and to recognize books that emphasize and explore the idea of liberty. Because not only doesn't liberty seem to be a natural idea, but it seems to be a relatively recent one. Humans are social hates. We come from creatures who lived in a bin. From studying ancient civilizations and some relatively modern ones, it seems to me that the very idea of liberty 
the idea of doing something one wished to do outside the norms of the band was alien to most of our ancestors. As alien as the idea of not wielding full power over those under our control still seems to be for most people. And it is a pretty difficult idea to implement. As the parent of grown sons, it is almost overwhelmingly tempting to say, no, don't do that. You can't do that. You're not allowed to do that. I did that. I know how the story ends. But this is their story, not mine. And things have changed, especially since I was born and grew up in another country. Don't adjust your set. This is actually my accent. So it's difficult, but I have learned to step back and allow them their liberty. And what we know is that though the idea of individual liberty is recent, where it is allowed to flourish, it leads to the greatest freedom, prosperity, and paradoxically, security for most individuals. And because perfect liberty doesn't exist anywhere, and the idea of liberty itself doesn't exist anywhere in this world outside the human brain. It's important to dream about it, to define it, to write about it, and most of all to recognize it, particularly in works that are fun because most of us don't write to preach. Because we can't create we can't create My camera seems to have failed, so I'll continue in voice. Because we can't create what we can't visualize. And creating liberty repays the human race most generously. The Prometheus Award does an exceptional job of recognizing writers who dream liberty into their works. As such, it is my pleasure to introduce the five finalists for the 2020 Prometheus Hall of Fame for Best Classic Fiction. Sam Hall, a 1953 short story by Paul Anderson, As Easy as ABC, a 1912 story by Rudyard Kipling, The Trees, a 1978 song by the rock group Rush, a Time of Changes, a 1971 novel by Robert Silverberg, and Lippy Leggin, a 1978 story by F. Paul Wilson. And the work in inducted into the Prometheus Hall of Fame is Sam Hall. Anderson's daughter, Astrid Anderson Baer, will accept the award for her late father. Good afternoon, and thank you, Sarah, and thank you to the members of the Libertarian Futurist Society for this honor to my late father, Paul Anderson. Dad deeply valued the awards he received from you all during his lifetime, and I'm sure he would have been pleased to receive this additional honor. Sam Hall has been nominated for the Prometheus Awards Hall of Fame several times previously, and it's a testament to its staying power as a story that it has now won. First published in the August 1953 issue of Astounding Magazine, it's been reprinted many, many times in anthologies as diverse as The Liberated Future, Computer Crimes and Capers, and Terrorists of Tomorrow. Science fiction set in the future is often as much about the time it was written in as it is about prognostications. Diving into both world and family history, we can tease out some of the threads that come together to make this story of the subversion of an authoritarian regime from within its record-keeping arm and how that inspired revolution. In 1953, we were less than 10 years from the end of World War II. Senator Joe McCarthy was busy investigating citizens for wrongful thoughts and potential treason. The early mainframe computer, UNIVAC, correctly predicted the winner of the 1952 presidential election. Dad's brother, my Uncle John, was turned down for the US Foreign, for the US Foreign Service because of his Danish communist aunt. And Dad wrote Sam Hall. Computer savvy folk of today will likely snicker a bit at the electromechanical horrors and buzzes of the government's central records computer, nicknamed Matilda the Machine. 
Matilda holds detailed information on all citizens, tracking all transactions, travel, education, contacts, relationships. The Matildas of today know a tremendous amount about us and our shopping habits, travel plans, and private emails. For although Dad did a good job of thinking about the power of computers held by the government as data gathering machines, in 1953, he didn't seem to have thought much about computers as gatherers of data for private enterprise. The America of Sam Hall has closed its borders to immigration, gives its citizens loyalty ratings, assigns them each a unique ID number, and demands that it is tattooed on the shoulder. There is an underground movement, but as our protagonist Thornburg muses, it was supported by foreign countries who didn't like an American dominated world at least not one dominated by today's kind of America, though once USA had meant hope. Thornburg, whose actions in changing Matilda's records start by trying to protect himself and his son from the taint of a treason accusation against a relative, finds that his anger at the political reality he lives in requires him to go further. He starts inserting more false information into the records and creates the digital rebel Sam Hall. Sam Hall was taken up by the underground as a Scarlet Pimpernel-like character, seen everywhere, doing everything, never being caught. There's growing violence in the streets, then civil war. Thornburg finds himself getting in deeper and deeper, and finally decides to become a wholehearted rebel himself, preparing to die if need be. Ultimately, the underground libertarian army prevails, and Thornburg is asked to work himself out of a job, dismantling Matilda, but saving just a bit of information, strictly practical facts. We are left to wonder how long the new regime stays true to its principles. The power of art is that older works can resonate with current events. Today, we have unrest in the streets. We have federal forces being deployed in cities under questionable authority. We have borders that are narrowing the welcome to immigrants. There are a lot of quotes from the late Congressman John Lewis that are relevant here about finding good trouble, speaking out when you see injustice, having the courage to do what's right. But let me close with this from his last essay in the New York Times. The vote is the most powerful nonviolent change agent you have in a democratic society. You must use it because it is not guaranteed. You can lose it. So please, be a, be a force for change. Vote. Thank you. Thank you very much, Astrid. We really appreciate you showing up to uh, talk about uh, your father and uh, his work. We all love his stuff. And thank you very much, uh, Sarah. Um, hi, uh, I'm Tom Jackson. Again, I'm your moderator for the second part of the Prometheus Awards doubleheader for NASFIC, where we have a panel discussion and we explore 40 years of the awards with two award-winning writers and with two insiders who know all about the awards. Give me just a moment to uh, introduce my panelists and then we'll go right into it. My writers include F. Paul Wilson, a New Jersey resident, Grand Master Horror Award winner and Prometheus Award Lifetime Achievement winner. He has written more than 60 books, including science fiction, horror, adventure, medical thrillers and young adult books. We gave him Prometheus Awards for Wheels Within Wheels, for Sims, for Healer and for An Enemy of the State. He has 8 million books in print in the US and is perhaps best known for his Repairman Jack novels. Although you may also know New York Times bestsellers such as The Keep, made into a movie in 1983. His novel Signals, part of the adversary cycle that includes The Keep and the Tomb, came out in July. Other Sandboxes, a collection of pastiches, will come out in October. It includes tributes to H.P. Lovecraft, Mary Shelley, Ray Bradbury, Richard Matheson, Edgar Rice Burroughs, Sax Romer, Dashiell Hammett, Arthur Conan Doyle, and others. Our other writer, Sarah Hoyt, a Colorado resident, is an American science fiction, fantasy, mystery, and historical fiction writer. She is a native of Portugal who moved to the United States in the early 1980s and became a U.S. citizen in 1988. She has warned readers that no genre is safe from me, and she's proven it by writing more than 30 novels under a variety of names, including a mystery series written under the name Elise Hyatt, the Furniture Refinishing Series. I just think that's the greatest name ever for a genre series. She won the 2011 Prometheus Award for Best Novel for her science fiction novel, Dark Ship Thieves, 
and won the 2018 Dragon Award for Best Alternate History Novel for Uncharted, co-authored with Kevin J. Anderson. Michael Grossberg co-founded the Libertarian Futurist Society to sustain the Prometheus Awards and chairs the Prometheus Awards Best Novel Finalist Judging Committee, which produces an annual slate of finalists for all of our members to vote on. And saying he is the co-founder is kind of the official way of putting it, but really it was Michael who took on the load of perpetuating the Prometheus Award and uh, organizing it. And it was a lot easier to, a lot, excuse me, a lot harder to do in the days before the internet. A theater critic and arts reporter since the early 1980s, Michael has contributed to six books, including critical essays for the annual Best Plays Theater Yearbook and an essay afterward for the first paperwork, paperback edition of J. Neil Schumann's Prometheus winning novel, The Rainbow Cadenza. He has many other publications and has won a stack of journalism awards. William H. Stoddard is the president of the Libertarian Futurist Society. And I can tell you from experience, he is a very diligent president and he's a very patient in dealing with personalities such as me. When we reelect him uh, every year, it's sort of a matter of quick, uh, get him in, in there again before he, he can get away. Uh, Bill is a copy editor specializing in scientific and scholarly publications. He has written more than two dozen GURPS supplements for Steve Jackson Gaines, beginning with GURPS Steampunk in 2000, which won an Origins Award for Best Role-Playing Supplement. Many of his essays and reviews have appeared at our Prometheus blog, which you can find at our website, lfs.org. We want to thank NASFIC for working with us and allowing us to present these programs. And I want to give a shout out to Chris Hibbert, also a member of our board, who is serving as our producer and technical advisor. And so now we'll start with a panel. Uh, and I'm going to start with our writers. Uh, uh, Wilson and Hoyt. The Prometheus Award encourages writers to explore political and philosophical ideas about freedom, self-ownership, non-aggression, and individual rights. Is there something about science fiction that lends itself to exploring these kinds of ideas? Yeah, well, with science fiction, you can, you can determine the background. You can, against which you're going to set your characters and it doesn't have, have to be you don't have to adjust to the real world you can make another plausible world where the conditions allow you to make those comparisons and to make the the plot points that will illustrate i mean for me i I don't like to have it too, I mean, libertarianism is my worldview. Um, I don't, I try desperately not to preach when, when I, I write, um, it, but it does seep through. But I, I think it's more effective if it does just seep through, that you're not preaching to, to the reader, you're sort of showing them this is how Maybe it could be. I'm not telling you you've got to agree with me, but um, just to trigger a little thought. Yeah, is it you know is all that government necessary? I mean, here's a guy who lives without it, and and has to work around it. Um, he doesn't seem like such a bad guy, uh, and and that's the sort of thing that that can lead readers to explore. Um, different ideas because when I started writing science fiction I chose a a blatantly libertarian future um, mainly because no one else was doing that and to me it was an alien philosophy to most people who were raised in America and educated in the American system so I said, well, I'm going to be writing about some aliens. Why not also have an alien philosophy uh, at work here? And um, 
all of a sudden I won, I won this award um, that I didn't really know anybody was was noticing. For, for me, I was doing it for myself because I thought this would, this would be a cool way to uh, structure a future. And yes, it could be like this. And then I was recognized, and it, it was uh, it was a great honor, and it was a tremendous pleasure to uh, find out I wasn't alone. Go ahead, Sarah. We can't see you, but we can hear you. I know. I seem to have turned into the invisible woman. Um, I also managed to do online my trick of always arriving late for a panel, uh, which you, you must admit was a new one. Um, I might intermittently show up since it's apparently trying to detect the camera. Uh, I presume we're doing introductions. Um, We've gone through that, and I'm going to repeat the question that uh, Thank you. Uh, Paul just answered. Um, we encourage writers uh, with our award to explore political and philosophical ideas, uh, including about freedom, of course, individual rights. Is there something about science fiction that lends itself to exploring ideas? I, I believe so. It's almost impossible for us to write the future without projecting our ideas of what that future will look like. Um, I mean, I suppose I could put myself into an utterly alien mindset, but not only would it be very hard, but if you go too far down that path, you risk your uh, readers not understanding you. It, it reminds me of when someone asked the, uh, why I had some alien sentences, but had neglected to apparently write the entire book in the alien language. And I had to point out I'd be perfectly willing to do that, but no one would be able to read it. So um, I think it's the same sort of thing. It's really hard for us to create the future without going with our innate assumptions. Uh, I mean, yes, it's possible for me to create a future where I deviate somewhat from what I believe, what, I, what do I mean? I don't necessarily write about the world as I believe it should be. But the way I create the characters, the way people react, the way gambits work out in the real world, all have to go back to what I've experienced, what I believe, what I think even subconsciously. So we will, ideas will be explored in science fiction because we are creating a future history and we're not all, we're not a hive mind. Each of us has different ideas. Even, even if we tried really hard not to explore any new ideas, an idea that I consider, oh, of course it's this way, will be absolutely shocking to someone out there. So, of course, science fiction explores ideas because we explore the future and that's right now only exists in our minds. Thank you, Sarah. And uh, Bill, I have a question for you, uh, since you're the chairman of our Hall of Fame nominating committee. People sometimes are surprised by the works that we give awards to, and uh, Lord of the Rings by J.R. Tolkien seems to be a case in point. To me, it seemed obvious uh, why we gave an award to that, but apparently it's not obvious to a lot of people. Can you explain that award? Mm, well, I, 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 am, I was going to start out by saying it seemed obvious to me, just as you did. <laughs> I mean, here is a novel that is about a ring of power, one ring to rule them all. And what does Tolkien show us about that ring? Well, he shows us first that it's a danger to the world. It enables its possessor to conquer and enslave the people. 
tools to go out and subjugate people and rule them according to his unique vision of how things should be with no input from anyone else. But also he shows us through other characters that the ring is dangerous to have, that it is corrupting, that it would, Gandalf and Galadriel both read the thought of having the ring because it would tempt them to use their power in the ways that would destroy them. Faramir says that he would not pick up this thing if he found it by the side of the road. And we see that it has a steadily corrupting influence on Frodo and in a sense that Frodo and Gollum are spiritual twins. Gollum is what Frodo is in danger of becoming. And it, we, Tolkien shows us that it is addictive, that the drive to power is addictive. And I, I am baffled that people read this and don't get a libertarian theme out of it myself, but I think part of it is that people look at this in terms of too much of the present, that they do not think in terms of the mindset that Tolkien was looking at. Tolkien is thinking in ter terms that came from Catholicism and that before Catholicism went back to Aristotle, the idea that there can be a good king or a bad king, a king or a tyrant, there can be a good minority, the aristocracy, or a bad one, the oligarchy, there can be good rule by the majority, or there can be bad rule by the majority, which Aristotle called democracy. And in each case, the good ruler is the one who rules as a trustee, exercising his power for the good of the whole society, not just of himself or his faction, but for the good of everyone. And the bad ruler says, no, I, I'm the boss. You're going to do the things the way I want to do. And we see that same thought in Madison's writings about the Constitution, where he warns about the danger of a either a minority or a majority having power. And he says a, major a faction that is a majority is the biggest danger, because they will rule on behalf of the majority interest against the minority. And certainly in his time, you had the, the issue of slavery, which was very much the white majority oppressing the black minority. So, and that kind of thing, that kind of thought goes, is different from thinking about the, the majority rule or the people rule. It's a more fundamental difference in Aristotle's view. And it's something that Tolkien was thinking of. The question is not only does the one or the few or the many rule, the more fundamental question is, who, who are they ruling for? Are they ruling for the whole under the law? Or are they ruling for themselves without regard for the law? And we see that very much in, we've seen people protest against Aragorn because he's a king, but Aragorn seeks the consent of the people of Gondor before becoming their king. And he rule, is clearly somebody who intends to rule under the law. And that is a, a profoundly libertarian idea that the rulers and the state should be under the law and not be a power in their own right. And I think that is why we gave the award to Tolkien. I'm, I'm glad you explained it so clearly because I wouldn't want people to think we simply tried to grab a famous book and, and impose our award on it. I, I think you explored pretty well why, why we did that. But now I have a question from Michael. Um, our award, in a sense, recognizes uh, an intersection between science fiction and libertarianism. And we've been giving it every year for 40 years, and we've never had a year where we had to tell our members, gee, we can't find any libertarian-themed science fiction works. You don't have anything to vote on today, uh, knock on wood. Uh, Michael, why, have there, why do we have so many intersections between science fiction and libertarianism? Well, first, I should mention we do have sort of no, no award, none of the above as an option on our ballot. And in the 1980s, there was one year where we had nominees and finalists, but the members of the organization decided that there shouldn't be a winner that year. So that's a possibility. But to answer your question, it's interesting to me that the Encyclopedia of Science Fiction itself recognizes that strong connection. In the libertarian SF uh, category, the, the listing in the encyclopedia refers to it as a major strand in science fiction. The, the listing goes on to say that more than any other social or political movement, libertarianism itself 
emerged in the 1960s and 1970s and expanded in the 1980s. Of course, we're in a dark period now of, of authoritarianism on the left and the right, so this is not a great decade for, for freedom, unfortunately. But, but it developed through people reading fiction, and that's really unusual in history of social and political movements. Now, we all know a lot of the most famous novels that, that turned on a lot of people to the fact that, oh, I already am feeling that way, or they introduced them to new ideas. I started off growing up as a Jewish liberal Democrat with a father from an ACLU uh, attorney. And it was quite a change for me to read books like Robert Heinlein's The Moon of the Harsh Mistress and some of his other novels, uh, Strangers in Strange Land, Ayn Rand's Atlas Shrugged and Anthem, L. Neil Smith, later on reading his The Probability Brooch or Jane Neal Shulman's Alongside Light. These are among the libertarian essays of classics that became bestsellers and turned on a lot of people to the ideas of libertarianism. But the interesting question is, why did it take fiction to help spur the most popular libertarian movement in America since the mid-1800s, when the libertarian abolitionist movement succeeded in paving the way for the end of slavery? I think it's because when you have something that people have viewed for centuries around the world as a necessary evil, whether government is a necessary evil, tyranny, uh, or slavery. Remember, slavery has been universal throughout all cultures and people of every race, religion, and ethnicity and nationality have enslaved people of every other uh, race and, and religion and, and nationality. Why did it last for so long? Because people, when they grow up in a particular world, a family, a country, we, sent, we tend to accept the status quo. We think, well, I don't like this. Gosh, I don't like it when this has this horrible consequence, but they can't imagine the alternative. Fiction helps us imagine an alternative and science fiction is the literature of ideas and possibilities can really help us imagine a freer future, a future without slavery, a future without coercive government, a society that might be more fully embodying civilized ideals of respect for each other's rights, cooperation rather than the institutionalized coercion of the unbridled state. It seems like when we have a discussion like this, it's only going to go so long before we bring up Robert Heinlein, who uh, has won seven Prometheus Awards uh, more than anybody else. So I'm going to ask uh, our two writers, uh, Paul and Sarah, um, how uh, has uh, Heinlein influenced your writing? Um, do you wish to go first, Paul? Go, go. Okay. Um, I'm messing with the camera still. <laughs> um, well, the thing that struck me, I, I really didn't take Heinlein. I mean, I never found anything objectionable in his um, uh, fiction. Uh, but I didn't really glom onto a story of his that was really set my my juices flowing with, with uh, until I read uh, a moon and horse mistress. Um, I thought that is is probably for me that is his pinnacle uh, as an influence. Um, I his future history was I think the biggest influence on, on my science fiction was that from the very beginning I decided I would have a future history like Heinlein had. Uh, before I even read that he had a future history I would be reading his stories and and you would have a character or an event from another story be mentioned in passing and that was such it, it was a thrill. Um, I was like hey I know what he's talking about. I've read that story. And, oh, the, these people, they're, they're in And uh, that added, to me, it added such, you know, the whole story is, is, is a snapshot in a way. Um, but it adds depth to those, those short stories because they're connected. And then you want to find another story that's connected to those two. And then, then when you find that third, you want to find the fourth. And I realized that this is a wonderful way to build a readership, but it's also a way to build a future. Because 
isolated short stories don't don't do too much to build they, they, they don't they're not expansive in, in, in world building. Whereas when you have them all linked, all of a sudden that future takes on a third dimension and even a fourth dimension because you can see things developing over time. So um, that was his biggest influence on me. But when I read The Moon of the Harsh Mistress, I realized you could have a, a libertarian themed novel. And even for someone who didn't get the, the very basic libertarian ideas behind Dan Stoffel, um, it's still a great story. So you can tell a great story, have these libertarian themes, and someone who is tone deaf to, to, to your nuances there um, will have a great time and thinks they've, they've, uh, they've gotten their money's worth. So that, that, that was an eye opener. Sarah, I know you love Heinlein, so I'm going to ask you to go ahead and weigh in, even if we can't see you. Even if I'm invisible. I, this is really disturbing me. I was trying to connect my son's camera. It also doesn't work. Uh, and it's annoying because it's just Zoom. All the other apps see the camera. So I guess Zoom decided to save me the embarrassment of showing my face. Um, my experience with Heinlein is probably unique because, uh, as I mentioned before, I was born and grew up in Portugal, and my family is still there. So this wasn't, uh, culturally, this wasn't a situation of Americans living abroad and raising a child abroad. I was Portuguese. And my first reaction to Heinlein books was annoyance including the first time I read The Moon's a Harsh Mistress, because so much of it seemed to be so strange. What's the point of objecting to paying taxes, which he made jokes about in several books. I mean, everyone pays taxes. That's the way it is. That's the way it's always been. And I can't identify when my mind started to change. I just know I started reading him when I was 12 or 13. And by the time I was 20, it didn't seem strange. It seemed more like, oh, yes, that, that makes sense. Finally, something that makes sense. And uh, he became not just the most important influence on my writing, but possibly on my life in many ways. I, I don't think I'd be here and I don't think I'd be a writer without timeline. Um, I, my, when I first started to get serious with my husband, I handed him a pile of Heinlein books and said, <laughs> read this or we can't see each other anymore. And, um, <laughs> and he did. So our firstborn is named Robert Tanson. Uh, he, was born, <laughs> he was born on the 7th of July, but that's just a coincidence. He, was, he started being born on the 4th. So you know, and uh, it's like, like Paul, I also felt the compulsion to write a future history. I'm not absolutely sure what it says about me that I now have three that have no points of contact between them. But uh, the Dark Ship Thieves, the, the winner of, of the 2011 award, was in fact the first result of that future history. It's, it's set solidly in the future history. And yes, I did that because I thought I had to. Heinlein did it. So. I'm, I think uh, Stacey Cherry and Jane Fancher are still uh, with us. So if you want to turn on the camera and answer that uh, question too, you're welcome to. Um, I read a science fiction novel, uh, Footfall, by Larry Niven and Jerry Cornell uh, years ago in which uh, Robert Heinlein and C.J. Cherry both 
appear as thinly disguised characters. So if you guys want to uh, jump in and weigh in, please do so. Well, um, when I, when I uh, talk to you, um, basically what, uh, uh, what I was thinking is that um, the way that Heinlein affected me, much as Sarah said, I read him when I was young. And um, I started reading him when I was very young. And his thoughts infiltrated my brain the same way that my libertarian brother's notions infiltrated my brain. So it became a part of what I accepted as how the world should work um, as far as the freedoms and, and free trade and so forth go on. But um, uh, I think that uh, within the scope of books, one of the things that is interesting as a writer is that rather than writing a quote libertarian book, which is not a problem. There's there are wonderful ones. I read Atlas Shrugged many years ago, and and uh, um, of course Heinlein's and and everything else. But one of the things that uh, the way that it was worked into and is worked into all of our literature is that it's an um, ongoing alternative to other methods, and so that. Um, you can you can use it just to sort of infiltrate the same way with any other uh, uh, societal uh, elements. You can use them as, and of course, this is the way it works. And uh, that's really all I wanted to say is that it can be done a little more subtly than just writing uh, a book that is uh, um, like Atlas Shrugged is is the is, is the one I can point to the most thoroughly. But uh, anyway, that's, that's really all I wanted to say. And, and Sarah basically said it for me. So I didn't need to be here anyway. <laughs> We're glad you're here. <laughs> and CJ Cherry, just, just for the benefit of the rest of us, will never appear as a character in somebody else's novel. What was it like to be in footfall? Was it <laughs> annoying? Was it uh, flattering? Uh, oh, I can say it was a surprise. <laughs> No, I um, uh, I had the, the pleasure of knowing Robert Heinlein briefly, um, and um, I uh, very much enjoyed the meeting. <laughs> but I, I honestly uh, never planned to uh, to figure in a novel. <laughs> um, I will say that um, uh, as far as the the, uh, the the themes that we have worked with the the human freedom, the freedom to choose, the freedom to vote with your feet, and so on and so forth. I view that as a far more likely human future, being an optimist, than I do the the, you know, the dark lord of the empire or uh, these other notions where we have abdicated all responsibility to somebody who will direct our lives. I don't think that's the way human beings tick. If you get one of those started, pretty soon there's a bunch meeting in the shadows to do something about it. And well, the, the Roman legions who, who stopped at the at the edge of the territory sat down and said, give us a reason to go on. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> and, and it's not a totally new idea. <laughs> a historical incident, they were being asked to go to the south of Rome and they reached the end of the Roman, the Roman territory and they plunked right down in the middle of the road and made their commander explain where they were going and why. And, um, you know, I, I, I think- I have faith in human character and, and uh, I, think, I think basically we want to do our own thing. <laughs> right. right. So at any rate- At any rate, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll kind of let you go on. It's been fun listening in, but uh, you guys have uh, 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 a wonderful thing going and I, don't want to interrupt anymore. Yeah. So we'll, we'll just go on listening. <laughs> All right. Thank you, ladies. And Paul, I saw you raise your hand. Did you have something you wanted to add? I was scratching my head. <laughs> uh, 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 well, well, we're going to put you to work again, Paul. A uh, question for both Paul and Sarah. And uh, it is a question uh, all suited for CJ Cherry, too. How has winning awards, the Prometheus Award and others, affected your career or did it affect your career? Well, I could start off and I would say um, if it had an effect, it was an indirect effect. 
um, one of the one of the fallout was that I started hearing myself referred to as that libertarian science fiction writer, um, which I wasn't too pleased with. Uh, not because I was worried about uh, the libertarian designation, but I was uh, I was concerned about being put in a box, and. Um, which is something that for me is, uh, you know, it's a straitjacket. I, I didn't want people to, every time they open one of my books to expect something that was, was libertarian. Um, I, uh, I, I, I'm a genre hopper. I, uh, and I think Sarah is as well. And we, we genre hoppers, you know, we, we need our freedom, you know, it's, it's, uh, to go where we want to go and do what we want to do. And um, I've, uh, so th that actually spurred me into moving into horror, which was another one of my, my loves. I, I, you know, I had two big loves growing up. Uh, one was horror and one was science fiction. And um, I started off in science fiction because there was no market for my horror, even though I, um, the first science fiction, the first story I ever saw was with the Campbell, and it was called Rat Man, and it has a, a fellow who winds up being eaten alive by, by these mutated rats. Um, I don't know why I thought I would send it to, to Campbell, but he bought it. Um, so, but that was that was where my horror roots were. Also, if you if you read the Terry, which was published as part of Binary Stars, um, at one point Jim Jim Franco said, "You've got enough horror in here now. Let's tone it back." So, I went and wrote the Creep, and which was a career changing book. Uh, so, in a sense, I have to th I have to thank the uh, Prometheus Award for, in a sense, pushing me to move into a different genre. And um, it, uh, you know, and so I wrote horror fiction all through the 80s and into the 90s uh, until it, it, it had experienced that, that huge bust. But um, uh, other than that, you know, the, the Prometheus Award was, what, what was the spur uh, that, that sent me into a different genre. Yeah. I, um, I think it had a greater effect on me than on most people receive it, simply because I was still fairly obscure. Uh, partly because not only am I a natural genre hopper, but I came in at the time when uh, publishers to want you to move and do something else. So I haven't built much of a following, even though at the time I had, I think, three series that, that were pretty much dead-ended. And um, when, I, when I got the, the Prometheus Award, and I thought to other people said, who have received it and said, well, I didn't notice any difference, but I noticed a very uh, marked difference in that all of a sudden, all sorts of people who had never heard of me were reading the book. Mm -hmm. And uh, so to me, it was a huge boost to my career. Um, I. You know, I'm such a weird collection of background and most people the first time they actually hear me speak, I've had people who have read me for years and I, because we're all online, I join in the meeting or something and I hear, whoa, you have an accent. <laughs> and, and because they assume I was raised aboard in an American uh, base, not, not as a foreigner. And so, you know, there are people who put me in all sorts of boxes of their own making anyway. And I've 
you know, the boxes are so contradictory that the only way they keep me there is if they really want to. And do I might tell them they can't. But uh, it's, it's, you know, uh, probably the worst boxes were from the publishing establishment itself, who kept telling me that my one authentic novel had to be Portuguese. <laughs> which, which made me question their sanity because I left there permanently at 22, but before that I was in and out since 17. So I have no experience of being an adult in the culture, which is extremely hard. It would be easier to write about it as a complete foreigner having studied it than as someone who grew up there and now has no clue what's going on most of the time. Um, I mean, we, we have the weird experience of being lost in, in the backwater in the mountains, my husband and I, and we couldn't figure out which place was the restaurant. There's always one, might be a tavern or something, but, but there were no signs and I could no longer read the context. So, you know, my husband was going, you have to know where this is. I'm going, um, no, and we might end up barging in someone's living room. I, <laughs> I have no idea. So we stayed hungry until we drove someplace that actually had signs. Uh, but I'm that alien. So, and at the same time, I remember things from when I was a kid, which like all kids might be mistaken. So it was actually not really something I could do, but they were convinced because I guess I'm genetically Portuguese and was born and raised there. That was the only novel I should write. And I found that an incredibly restricting box telling me, you know, this is the only one that will be authentic. So other than that, boxes don't bother me. Sometimes people assume things and then they get over it. It's it's fine. CJ Cherry, this is a chance for me to find out if something is true. Is it true that when you got your first Hugo Award, you responded by quitting your day job? <laughs> Actually, I, I had already quit my day job. I, I was a school teacher, uh, Latin and ancient history. And um, uh, I, um, John Walheim, bless his heart, um, uh, wrote to me and when I I can't even remember what letter actually prompted it but I'd written to him and then he wrote back to me and he said all right here's an advance on I forget how many books it was I think it was three three is what you always told yeah me. I think it's three and and quit your job and write and I just said, gulp, this is more than I make in a year. <laughs> I think I can survive. And now I just have to write three books. Nobody is uh, probably worse paid than Oklahoma teachers. <laughs> well, <laughs> there is that. But, but at any rate, um, uh, I did quit at that point. And by the time I did win my first Hugo, um, I... Uh, that was Cassandra? Uh, that was for Cassandra. Yeah, that was a short story, um, which I would occasionally spin off now and again. Um, and, um, you know, a story just wants to be written. It has to be written right then, especially if it's a short story. So I, I did. And, and that one, that one, yeah, it, it worked. Um, but, Did you notice an increase in readership after you? Well, I'll tell you, the, the one thing that the, the Hugo or any award does is the publisher immediately plasters it on the cover of your next book, um, award-winning author, whatever have you, and that will prompt somebody who's never read to pick up the book and at least give it a look. And that helps, that helps immensely. As science fiction writers, we don't get big publicity. We don't have the huge ad campaigns or uh, whatever. So we take what we can get and those awards do help. They help us a lot. Well, Bill and Mike, you've been coasting, so we're gonna put you to work again. How do you, as, as long time uh, Prometheus Award administrators and judges, 
How do you feel about the Prometheus recognizing dystopian works as opposed to recognizing books that advance positive ideas, uh, such as this year's winner, Alliance Rising? Well, I'd like, uh, Bill, you, right. I'd like to start if I could. I, I agree that positive visions are great, such as the way that Alliance Rising shows how people, flawed as they are, working in an interstellar future on, on different uh, colonies can reduce the threat of conflict and war through free markets. That's very positive. But I don't think that dystopian views are negative. I think if they're insightful and compelling, they show us the horrors of tyranny and slavery or the, the progressive decline of a civilization through uh, increasing uh, abuses of power and expansion of power. And I think that's very libertarian in showing the truth of the great British Catholic liberal historian, Lord Acton, who said, power tends to corrupt and absolute power corrupts absolutely. So I'm very glad that we have an honored and necessary place in our roll call of Prometheus winners for such classic dystopian works as Orwell's 1984 and Animal Farm, uh, Bradbury's Fahrenheit 451, Anthony Burgess's A Clockwork Orange, Ayn Rand's Atlas Shrugged and Anthem, Ira Levin's Underestimated This Perfect Day, which imagine sort of a therapeutic state with medication as the sort of a soft tyranny. And I wish that's the one Ira Levin book that's not been made into a movie. It would make a great film. Alan Moore and David Lloyd's graphic novel, V for Vendetta, and also Ursula Le Guin's more complex and somewhat dystopian comparison of socialist and capitalist models on two rival planets in the dispossessed. So I love dystopian literature because of the negative lessons it teaches us, which I view as positive. Okay, I'm going to say something slightly different, which is but most basically yes and no. Dystopian fiction as such is not necessarily libertarian or relevant to libertarianism. Uh, there are dystopian novels that uh, where you just have the idea of an awful society, a bad society that oppresses people. And it, it's, it is a cliche now in the same way that, for example, in the co comic book stories for a long time, you had this sinister corporation manipulating things and the corporate villain was became a cliche. You did not necessarily have any coherent vision of why the corporation was doing this or what led them down this evil path. You do not necessarily, in a dystopia, have an understanding of why they are going for in for this dystopian path. I think that you, some dystopias have a strong libertarian message and the ones that have a new insight are worth honoring. I'm going to cite uh, Joe Walton's series, Farthing Haypenny and Half a Crown, which is set in an alternate history England uh, where basically a Nazi sympathetic government took over and declared peace with Germany. And, and it's not hardcore dystopian. It, they're basically cozy murder mysteries when you come right down to it. But they are, it is a very grim society. But the interesting thing about it is the insight into the moral corruption of, a, in this case, a police officer officer, a detective, who is trying to work in a dark, oppressive society and showing how, what compromises he makes and how he is tempted to betray his own sense of integrity. That is a source of insights, and I think a dystopia work can be that. And that is also relevant to libertarianism in an interesting way, but it, it depends on the dystopia. I think that, that is what I have to say. Some dystopias are very formulaic and cliched, and some dystopias are insightful and have something new to say. And those are the ones that deserve recognition. I agree. I want to add a, a minor bit of literary history, by the way, to something that Paul said a while ago about the moon is a harsh mistress. Some years ago, we gave Bernard Vinge a Lifetime Achievement Award. And during his acceptance speech, he talked about his novels, especially The Peace War and Marooned in Real Time, being influenced by David Friedman's 
Friedman's libertarian book, The Machinery of Freedom. And Friedman, who was in the audience and had come down for the presentation, turned around and talked about how he had been inspired to start thinking about his model of anarcho-capitalism and his concept of a free society by reading The Moon is a Harsh Mistress. So there you have a nice little bit of inspirational thing that Heinlein did. He was an influence on Vinge at second hand. And of course, we've given the Prometheus uh, uh, quite recently to Travis Corcoran novels that obviously are influenced by The Moon is a Harsh Mistress. Uh, and uh, Ian McDonald arguably might have been uh, influenced by that in his uh, acclaimed Luna books, which were on the Hugo ballot uh, this year. Um, another question for our writers. Um, both of you have created long running series um, if you go to uh, F. Paul Wilson's uh, website, repairmanjack.com, you can see how many of his works are tied to his secret history of the world. Uh, and of course, uh, all of us have read uh, Sarah's uh, Dark Ship series uh, and her I, series. Oh, hi, Sarah. We see you now. Uh, and of course, uh, C.J. Cherry and Jane Fancher just won for a book that returns to the uh, Alliance uh, universe. Why do writers do that, tend to write fiction as part of this series? And are there going to be any more Repairman Jack or Dark Ship or uh, Alliance universe books? Yes, yes. <laughs> and because it's a lot of work to make that universe. <laughs> that. So you may as well use it. You've, you've built the universe and it's there to be explored. Is that yeah, part of the end. has a story, and there's a whole lot of them out there. And Carolyn wrote in that universe for years without addressing this, un with only alluding to this underlying uh, what was going economic on the theme that we're dealing with yeah. here. And uh, and it's a lot of work. We talked about uh, doing a new universe, um, a new. We even talked about doing a YA uh, book. But it's a lot of work to do that. And she had it just sitting there with all these holes in it. I've got a notebook you wouldn't believe. <laughs> Things an inch thick. <laughs> so anyway, that's, that's our answer. <laughs> lots, lots still to explore. Is, is Repairman Jack on strike until uh, the Repairman Jack movie comes out? And when does the Repairman Jack movie come out? And then we'll let Sarah answer. Um, Repairman Jack movie. Probably right after Godot. Uh, <laughs> I got briefly excited. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, that, I probably have done the last Repairman Jack book. Although, I mean, if something uh, appeals to me, I I'll do it. Um, with Jack, the, the main attraction I had with, with Repairman Jack was that it allowed me to genre hop within series. So I'm, I've always annoyed the marketing department by switching to something else. Once they, they say, oh, you've just built up an audience here. Now you're going to do this. Um, and I said, yeah, because that's the next book. And so with, with Jack, they were happy because I could write a ghost story. I could write a conspiracy novel. I could write a high tech novel. I could write a medical thriller. As long as Jack is the protagonist, they know how to market it. And so it made everybody happy. I mean, it, it, the readers were happy for the variety. Uh, the marketing department was happy because they knew what to do. Editor was happy because uh, we were selling. So, I mean, for that, it was, it was a, a great solution for me. But I didn't I... want to the dirt. That's what I was afraid of. You know, it got to the point where the weight of all the books got to the point where I, I figure I have to end it. I have to stop it now. Otherwise, I'm going to wind up like Robert B. Parker Spencer, where, you know, you pick up a Spencer book in, in, in the later years and you say, I've read this already. And he, he was just repeating himself. So I don't want I, I don't want to do that. You know, Jack's too important to me. So I'll, I'll, I'd like to go out on a high note. Sarah? Um. First, I, I discovered Repairman Jack by accident because I got 
a free book. It was hosts at uh, uh, Kansas, the, that convention. And I mistaken, I, I still attribute this to an act of fate because I was sorting the books I was going to take on the plane to read on the plane. This was pre-Kindle. So, you know, you know that the anxiety of being in the air and all of a sudden you don't have reading material. And I looked at the cover and I thought, well, looks more like a thriller. I, I don't really want to read that right now. And I swear I put it in checked luggage. However, when I got on the plane and I realized the book I had selected to read was just not to my taste, I started looking through the bag and there it was. So I read it on the way to Colorado. And by the time we landed, it was pretty late. Before going to bed, I went up to my office and ordered the rest of the series from Amazon, which back then was brand new. So thank you for those books. For a while, when you brought a new one out, everything stopped in the house while I read it. So, uh, on Dark Ship Thieves, it was the future history was written. Uh, the book was actually written when I was 28. Uh, it went in the drawer for a long time. Periodically, I sent it out and people said, we don't know what to make of this. So, you know, please put it away again. And... I had the entire future history worked out. When I sold it, I did, I sold it because I had just gotten a conference in Bayon's Bar. And I had gotten the lunatic who hung out there because I was fairly unknown. And I had gotten the lunatic used to the fact that I posted a short story for free on Friday because at that time I had sold something like a hundred short stories. I ran out of short stories that I could put up. So I started, I said, okay, I'm going to post a chapter of this novel from the drawer. And I think I got chapter five and I got an email from Tony saying, stop, 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 I'm buying the book. And I went over it and changed some things because it had been something like 14 or 15 years, I'm not sure. And meanwhile, I had written a lot of books and my style had changed. So I did a quick dust and fix. But the problem is my dust and fix and, and how I write too. I start out with an outline, but then fits of brilliance include under the heading of, wouldn't it be fun if and something gets tossed into the plot. All this to say, by book five, I had this unyieldy amount of, I had made references to various periods in back history, to how things were done. I, I have the great- Senator, I have to warn you, we're getting to the two minute warning here. So I'm go sorry, ahead. I'm sorry. I have the great advantage that none of my characters knows a lot about what actually happened. So I can always say, well, that's his misapprehension. But one of my fans did a very complete Bible, which is very useful. And yes, there will be more. Uh, I, I have plans for more. Well, I, I, I thought the, the last uh, Dark Ship book uh, was the best. So I'm looking forward to the additional ones. Um, I feel like we're only getting started. This has been very interesting, but unfortunately, we're nearly out of time. And as a courtesy to the people who are supposed to be in the space in uh, 60 seconds, I'm afraid we're going to have to go. So I want to thank everybody for taking part. I want to thank NASPIC for permitting us to take part in the program. If you want to find out more about the Prometheus Awards, uh, go to LFS.org. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks for letting us crash. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks.